1976 was the year that British kids played on space hoppers, rally choppers, and Concorde took off for the first time with paying passengers. Cheery lunch, appetizers of caviar and lobster, champagne, fresh strawberries, and the very best wines. In 76, I was lucky enough to go on one of Concorde's first flights. Slight sensation as the reheat is turned on, then through Mach 1 and onto Mach 2, the muzzle velocity of a rifle bullet. And I actually went supersonic while I was in the toilet. Also about to engage its afterburners and take off into British history was the longest, driest summer for the last three centuries. The furnace lit and we suddenly went into these uh, scintillating temperatures of 28, 32, all over the uh, south of Britain. That's when we were really broiling. The first big advantage of the early heat wave went to Wimbledon. First of all, it wasn't a washout for the first time ever in living memory. The problem was, it didn't just shine, it burned and frazzled, it fried. People were frying their eggs on the pavement while they were waiting to get into Centre Court. It was certainly the hottest Wimbledon record. Hundreds of people needed treatment for heat exhaustion. Spectators were taking off their shirts. Uh, the umpires, a couple of them dozed off. It was like a ferocious tropical experience. The strawberries were crying. Sue Barker was 20 that summer. She beat Maria Bueno, who was Brazilian, because Maria Bueno wilted in the heat, apparently. And the poor old tennis players really looked as though they were being barbecued as they played. Borg won Wimbledon in that year. Before your very eyes, you could see his beard. London was ill-prepared for the heat wave. Temperatures on the tube were soaring to 37 degrees centigrade. At that time, I'd travelled around on the underground, and it used to be so hot and sticky. You'd have some man we're holding on to the, the toggle in front of you with B.O. The sweltering conditions created a perfect storm for the first major incident of the long, hot summer. On my show, there was a Radio 1 bulletin and uh, that said that people were trapped and nobody was geared up for it. At 10.30 a.m. on the 25th of June, the Bakerloo line suffered catastrophic signalling failure between Swiss Cottage and St John's Wood. It was stiflingly hot anyway, and a journey that was meant to take eight minutes took over 90. There was no air conditioning or anything, and people were passing out. This big blonde guy who was stripped to the waist started swinging on the, the leather straps until finally he was able to kick the windows through. People started walking along the track, which I would have thought was quite dangerous. I mean, you don't know if it was electrified or not, but it was a horrific event. Not even an apology, actually, from London Transport. They said, well, you know, nobody went to hospital, nobody died, and so, you know, it's just one of those things. As passengers staggered out into the sunshine, few realised that their experience was just the first in a pattern of heat-induced events that over the following nine weeks would test Brits to their limits. It was like a really horrible, cheap, low-budget horror film, and it was really happening at a seaside near you. By the beginning of July, the long, hot summer of 1976 was just two weeks old, but already starting to break all records. It was, oh my God, this is heat the like of which we've never known. For 15 consecutive days, temperatures across the country reached at least 32.2 degrees centigrade, peaking at 35.9 on the 3rd of July in Cheltenham. Everyone was sort of stripping off and the men were all walking with no shirts on in the street and it was just bliss. I loved it. I loved every single moment of it. I was jet skiing, I was water skiing. It was just absolutely amazing. Every day it was sunny. Every day there was a blue sky and you never saw a cloud. It was like living in the Mediterranean. The, the amazing weather attracted bumper crowds to Radio 1 road shows. Today from the North Fitzgerald Beach, Newquay with... Ma this is the, the one road show this year I've really been looking forward to because 
Everybody says just how fantastic New Quay is. You know, you'd get crowds and crowds of people on, like, Bournemouth Beach, and you'd have, like, Dave Lee Travers. Right, coming up to nine minutes before 12 o'clock on 247 National Radio 1. Noel Edmonds, uh, you know, they were the biggest celebrities of those days. That summer, a new craze, probably helped by catchy adverts, invaded suburban gardens across the country. Swing ball from Dunlop, a great ball game that's swinging everywhere. Player to win, play it for fun, for any time, for anyone. Everyone, swing ball. And if families couldn't afford a tennis ball on a string attached to a stick, kids were simply expected to make their own fun in the sun. We just played out, we played sports, we were playing football, tennis, cricket. So I just remember it, yeah, with unalloyed happiness, really. We had no mobiles. I mean, I was considered a person of disappearance regularly by my mother every 24 hours because she could never find me. I remember my West Indian friends talking about the fact that this is not the London they had come to. This was unexpectedly hot. I was a drama student. We were at the Hippodrome Theatre and it was hot. I was dressing the whole of the cast of Dad's Army. Ian Lavender was so hot, he would be in his underpants till five minutes before he was due on stage. I remember chasing him through the corridors, telling him he has got to get these thick flannel trousers on. In 1976, there were no weather apps for the latest forecast. The closest thing we had to the internet was a telephone exchange. Today, an extraordinary range of information is available by just picking up the telephone. And I'm standing now in what is, in effect, the nerve centre from which all this information is dispensed. Yet, only half of the UK population had a landline. The average house price was under £13,000, a weekly wage, £72, and a pint of beer would set you back 25 pence. To stand outside in the street drinking your pint of beer, uh, which these days we take completely for granted, in those days didn't happen until that summer. That's really when it started. I think the only thing that put me to sleep was those three pints of beer in the pub every evening, because you just had to keep replenishing. There was a casualty doctor at Charing Cross Hospital in London, and he said that everybody should drink a pint of beer and eat a packet of crisps to replace the salt and the fluid that they were losing through the heat. It's the peak of the holiday season. Because of the hot weather, sales of some drinks are up by 30%. A newfangled chilled beer was rapidly swallowing up 20% of the UK market. Suddenly people were drinking lager because it was advertised on the telly every 10 seconds and you kept seeing the advert and thinking, oh, lager, marvellous. Three pints of skull, please. Sorry, we don't sell skull here. The lager of the moment may have boasted a Scandinavian-inspired name, but it was actually a brand developed in central Scotland. Clear, golden, beautiful head. And that flavour. Uh, and skull drinking. It's the taste that makes you do it. There wasn't the kind of convenience culture then that there is now. Uh, so we think we take ice, for instance, we take it from completely for granted. You go into a pub now and ask for a gin and tonic and you expect it to be kind of filled up with ice. And in those days, if you were lucky, you might get one cube of ice. Suddenly, people were asking for six cubes of ice. There was no ice dispensers back then. The extraordinary thing about this time is no one ever drank water. A glass of water was looked on like something that had come out of your bath. We only ever drank squash. We always had a jug full of tap water on the table, which meant that any other drink at all was just impossibly attractive and exotic. As the summer heated up, I just drank more and more Coca-Cola, or more and more Tab, more and more Fanta. They were very often just warm, just handed to you off a shelf. News agents didn't have fridges. One was a kind of Fanta drink that had a polar bear on the front of the glass bottle and it furred your tongue up as you drank it. In the 70s, soft drinks were marketed for their sugary rush properties to almost hallucinogenic proportions. Hi, man. This is Cresta's new flavour, black currant. I wonder what's... <laughs> 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 Timber! 
These drinks actually... On the 5th of August, a drought bill was hurried through Parliament. The ten water authorities in England and Wales at that time issued 139 drought orders. That was them trying to get a grip, and um, they did what they could. They brought in hosepipe bands. If you live in Wessex, where they're exper experiencing the worst drought for 150 years, you really can be taken to court if they catch you using a hosepipe and fined up to £20. There were hosepipe detector vans driving around the neighbourhoods in those days, and neighbours were very much encouraged to grass, no pun intended, on people who were watering their gardens. You felt that you were letting your neighbours and the whole nation down if you were using too much water. With thirsty gardens capable of swallowing up 1,200 litres of water per hour, it was estimated that the hosepipe ban was saving the Bristol area a million gallons of water a day. But this spelt disaster for the green-fingered community. Our garden was a bomb site, bloody awful. Our grandparents' rose bushes were dying off, their apple trees were dying off. Then my garden in Birmingham was turning brown. We've got a garden and we've saved every drop for our garden. But uh, whether people will waste more than save, I, don't, I really don't know. There were people going out right in the middle of the night with their hose watering the garden and <laughs> desperately not letting their neighbours know they were doing it. It made us all watch each other in a kind of Stalinistic way. And that's a little bit sad. It actually divided our community. It made us distrust each other. This is the Bath Corporation the Waterworks Department. The water supply to this area will be interrupted between the hours of 12 noon and 7 p.m. There were restraints on domestic water use and in some cases, a necessary shift to the use of standpipes. Communal taps, known as standpipes, started to replace the mains water supply across thousands of homes in Yorkshire and East Anglia. A man would come down the street with a big, huge, screwy thing, lift up something in the road and just turn the mains off. How do you feel about having your water cut off for eight hours at a stretch? That's going to be a little difficult, isn't it? What sort of difficulties is it going to cause? Well, I have for you? two children of 19 months, and uh, there's all their nappies to wash and all their clothes. Eventually, we had to collect water in the street at certain times. We had to fill buckets, we had to fill any containers we had. We were even filling jugs. And it was, you know, what life is probably like in certain parts of the world all the time. As Britain entered the last two weeks of August 1976, there was still no end in sight to the driest summer since records began. Forest fires were being reported from Scotland to the Channel Islands. Fires were bursting out all over. Heathland, moorland, and forests and woods. The fire brigade couldn't control them because there was no water <laughs> to, to dampen the fires. So you wouldn't believe how terrific it has been. The pressures all day and all night, we I haven't had time to get back for meals or rest, recreation, anything. On the 19th of August, the Forestry Commission disclosed that fires had destroyed about 1,000 acres of plantations valued at £500,000. Many forests were closed to the public until the end of the drought. Everything was uh, tinder dry. And of course, some people would stupidly smoke and then throw the stub end away, and it was still alight. It was a real problem. If someone came along and lit a pipe at the moment and threw away a match, it's quite possible that the fire would start up immediately that the match hit the ground. There were forest fires, the kind now that we're used to seeing on our television screens happening in California and Australia, wildfires, basically, and they were a daily occurrence. This is how dry things are and we spread with very rapidly through, through a forest area. In fact, some people are absolutely staggered by the speed of travel of fires in this situation. Perhaps the worst day was on the 22nd of August, when conflagrations destroyed 200,000 trees in South Wales. The Hampshire Fire Brigade found itself fighting more than 160 individual fires, and in Dorset, 346 elderly patients became trapped. There was one old people's home in the 
path of a fire. They had to be very quickly evacuated because the fire was advancing at 30 miles per hour. These were problems on a scale that we hadn't really experienced before. It would take decades for all of our natural habitats to recover. But the prolonged heat wave was having an immediate and devastating impact on people's health. In 1976, none of us were that aware of the effect on the elderly, and they were dying. Very old people who particularly have controlled heart disease, but as soon as they get exposed to these high environmental temperatures, then of course they do have severe risk of going into heart failure. Doctors are always telling us, though, that uh, this thing is bad for us or that thing is bad enough. Now you're complaining about the heat. Do you really expect to be taken seriously? Well, I think uh, most old people will probably take very little notice of what we're saying. A Cardiff doctor suggested this morning that um, the very strong sun could be dangerous to old people and it could give them heart attacks. Oh, I can't I look at I'm nearly 80. It's never been... Over the last 20 years, Britain has suffered a series of scorching summers, such as those of 2003. Across much of Britain, the heat is on. In 2006, drought orders were back for a heat wave that affected the whole of Europe. Britain is not used to sun as strong as this. Our most recent drought was in 2018 where parts of the country went without rain for 50 days. The grass in Hyde Park has turned to straw. These have made us all aware that global warming is on the rise. But since 1976, the country has never had to return to widespread standpipes and water rationing. Over the last 40 years, governments have continuously invested in desalination plants improved reservoirs and new main systems to transfer water in bulk to affected areas. I think Britain now is probably much better equipped to deal with a, a heat wave and a drought like that. You know, nobody had a, even an ice tray back in 1976, but it would still be an issue if it didn't rain for that length of time. It's pretty unusual for this country. Whether or not we ever see a summer like it again, for those who experienced it, 1976 will forever remain halcyon. Summer of 76 was the greatest summer of my life. My career began. I discovered a form of music that just built my future and I loved it. It was fabulous. Not that I'm hoping for global warming, but I do love it when we have a really hot summer. And I wouldn't mind if another summer like 76 came round again. The long, hot summer of 76, the best year ever, the best summer of my life. A kind of epic, beautiful, unusual, unfathomable, inexplicably brilliant time. And we have never seen its like again.